This is Oyente Tambo, and it's the last Inca town which is still more or less intact. Behind us are the horses that are going to take us up to a quarry, the quarry from which the granite was taken to, uh, to make the Temple of the Sun. But also what we're going to find are elongated skulls and supposedly an intact skeleton. So from this we'll be able to see how tall these people were and that is today's quest. So we're now on an Inca trail and we're on horses. This is part of what uh, is called the Inca Trail, or the famous trail, and it leads all the way to Machu Picchu. But that's not where we're going today. Today we're going up to the quarry site where megalithic stones were extracted and used to form the Temple of the Sun at Oyente Tambo. So we've left Oyente Tambo far in the background and we are continuing to head upwards. So, with the sacred valley far below us, still heading up to the quarry, about halfway there, and uh, it's up there where we will find the giant stones that were uh, cut out of the bedrock granite in order to create the sun temple. It's also up here where the tombs are and where we will see the elongated skulls. You're looking at a mountain of solid granite. And some of the stones that were extracted, shaped, and put into place at Oyente Tambo weigh 65 tons. So the question is, how was the stone cut and how was the stone moved? Was it moved on a little trail like this? Or is it possible that some of those stones predate the Inca by thousands of years and the workmanship was done by a culture that was technically superior or at least more advanced than the Inca were and that the Inca inherited the Temple of the Sun. These are tombs, you can see. We're getting closer to the quarry because you can see the scale of the stone 
which is starting to present itself to us. So we're still going up. You see the <coughs> sacred valley in the background. We're going up a series of Inca staircases now, and the horses were bred for this country. So they're small, but they're very strong, and luckily they're very docile as well. Hola. So you can see <coughs> stones are starting to show up that appear to have been shaped, at least the one back there was. This is the actual quarry, and you can see that massive debris field above. So either the Inca or earlier people were literally mining the side of the mountain and allowing the large stones to fall down where they would be shaped, or they may have naturally fallen down. But we have yet to see an example of a stone that has it cut to it. So we're up in the actual quarry now, and this behind me is, um, it's a construction by the Inca, probably as a sleeping place for the workers who were up here during the quarrying. What we're going to look for now is see if we can find some of the stones that has and have evidence of actual cut marks, because too many researchers have come up here, they've seen a flat surface and they've said, oh, that has to have been done by a laser. But it really requires a stonemason, a geologist, someone of expertise to make a clarified decision of that. And that's not me, but I've seen enough stone that I think I'll be able to identify what is a natural surface as compared to a shape surface. So you can see that this appears in some way to be a deliberate, almost ceremonial pathway. And it is because the cave that we've been looking for is right there. And this is supposedly where the elongated skull skeleton and other skulls are. So come, let's have a look. So we're in the cave and you can see that this is an example most likely of cranial deformation because of that. That could very well be where the binding was done and it's hard to tell how many plates it has because the skin is still on. But this one, this is a the bigger one here. And this does have, it has the normal number of cranial plates for a human being. It looks very much like it was cranial deformed because it's not that huge a skull. It does have the two holes in the back which um, are similar to the foramen here which is where blood flow comes to your jaw and in elongated skulls there are these two holes always in the back of the skull. This was an intact mummy, but someone has come and supposedly they were actually university students came here and took the mummy apart. It was originally in a fetal position, which is typical of the Inca and other cultures, but now it's taken apart. So after this, I'll go in deeper and explore more.
It looks like a wild place in your low tie. In the back? Yeah, can you see it? Mm hmm. Bueno, por ejemplo, este, este hueso es un bebé o algo así. Sí, pues es bebé. Y que no es adulto. Uh -huh. Es adulto. Uh -huh. Sí, es el pie, sí, es el pie. Es el talón. Uh -huh. es el talón. Sí, pero el ladito también. Uh -huh. Sí, de acá. Uh -huh. Una raíz se ha salido un palito. Aquí está el otro, mira acá. Y podría decir que ellos eran descendientes de los incas. ¿No? Sí, porque son diferentes mm. a los que hay, los mm -hmm. habitantes de acá. O sea, como ellos... So I've made approximate measurements of some of the femurs here, and two of them would appear that uh, the individuals here were between five foot ten and six foot one, and that's much taller than the average Peruvian of today possibly much taller than the average Inca, but um, a lot of local oral tradition says that uh, the Inca were in fact tall people. Um, however, that doesn't jibe with the Spanish chronicles, because if the Inca were much taller than the Spanish, and the Spanish would not have been very tall, then they would have written that down. They would have said these tall Inca people, but as far as I can tell, there's no mention of height. So it, it's possible that we're looking at pre-Inca people. Um, possibly descendants of the megalithic builders who built the Sun Temple and other megalithic structures in the Cusco and Sacred Valley. This area. is the entrance to a tomb high above the Sacred Valley of Peru outside of Cusco and it was found eight years ago and uh, since then there have been many people coming up to visit, uh, visit the area. Unfortunately, supposedly some students from one of the local universities came here. There was an intact mummy inside in the fetal position and either they or somebody else has disassembled it. But let's go inside and you can have a look at it. So here you can definitely see there's an elongated skull. And another. And another. And two more skulls which are abnormal in uh, shape farther in. A contemporary normal human being has three cranial plates and this one has four. This suture here is not normal in contemporary human beings, which is quite intriguing. What you'll also notice is the depression on the top of the skull like that. That could very well be a sign of cranial deformation and in some ways is eerily like what uh, we saw on our trip to Egypt in April because rather than being vertically elongated this is more of a horizontal elongation, somewhat like what, uh, what I saw when I saw the skull of Tutankhamun, who was a member of the Amarna family. Uh, you see this area here, where you see the, uh, you can see the scar tissue, and where there's that uh, depression. That probably is where the cranial deformation was done, now resting on my knee, and then possibly also done here and also here on top. So there may have been two fabrics or lashings which uh, were utilized in order to create the deformation. The skull is not much larger than a, a normal human being. So like in most examples what we're looking at is cranial deformation. However, if you look at some of the skulls of the Paracas culture, that's where we find volume of the skull much bigger, at least 25% in some cases, or 30% than a contemporary human being, and also very vertically elongated. And again with the second skull, the same thing. You see this depression up here. 
And so that could be where the cranial deformation was done. And this one as well is curious in that it has four cranial plates. This suture is not normal in contemporary human beings or in human beings in general. It could be a genetic anomaly. And this one, which is the third, is um, more of a vertical elongation than the other two. But in terms of the number of cranial plates, it's hard to tell because the skin is still on. You can see there the suture in the middle, but you also see the little holes. Those holes are indicative of crani or of elongated skulls. We're in the actual Inca period quarry, and you can see these roughly shaped stones. Now here, you see these lines in the stone, those are natural cracks. They're not saw marks and they're not evidence of lasers. So please get the idea of lasers out of your mind. Chris Dunn of the Giza Power Plant has worked with lasers and I'm sure he would say those are not examples. But this is the Inca period quarry. And you can see some long stones here, 15 feet long, one foot by one foot. And as we travel farther in, again, some roughly shaped stones here, and above there, and above there, and here, and across there. This one's about 22 feet long here. And as we travel farther up into the quarry, uh, that one has an interesting uh, cut out scoop shape in it, but the rest of them that we've seen, maybe two tons, three tons, four tons, megalithic, yeah, but not of the scale of the uh, Sun Temple. The Sun Temple at Ointe Tambo, there are finished stones which weigh 65 tons. So what we're going to try to do is find evidence of one or more of those and see if we can find tool marks on them. And we're now in the field of immense stones. This one, tens of tons, but no tool marks that we would recognize. Very large one here. And that one, you can see it's split in two. But if it was done by the Inca, if that was split by the Inca, we should see grooves where wedges would have been put, water, wooden wedges, water put onto the wedges so that they would swell and break the rock. That may well, very well be simply a natural crack. And then when the stone came down the hill, it broke that way. As of yet, still no examples of either primitive technology, well, we can see the primitive technology or the Inca st uh, Bronze Age technology because we can see where they took heavy stones, very dense material, denser than the granite, and chipped off corners and things. No examples of what one would call high technology, no saw cuts uh, so far, and definitely no signs of laser beams in use. So what we've seen is how the Inca shaped the stone. Most of the Inca uh, big pieces that are still here, two, three tons, are very long and thin. And so obviously the first step uh, that they did, which anyone who's ever worked with stone would do, is take the flaws out. So they would take a harder piece of stone and hammer away, and anywhere there was a crack, that piece would flake off, leaving you with a piece that was intact. And you could tell it was intact by hitting it and it should make a tone of some kind because it's intact and uniform. The great mystery is that we haven't seen one example in the huge blocks of 40, 50 plus tons up here, and the fact that there are 40, 50, 60 ton pieces at the Sun Temple, we haven't seen one example of high technology of any form. We haven't seen the scoop marks, which are typical of the pre-Inca high civilization that existed in this area.
the look that they were able to achieve was almost like taking a block of butter and a wooden spatula and scooping the surface. Haven't seen one example. What we have seen are a lot of cracks, and so most of this stone is not of super high quality. Some people have called those cracks saw marks, which is nonsensical. A saw mark is a uniform width, and it'll either have a horizontal, vertical, or circular striations in it, at least as far as um, saws are that we know of. And that's the mystery. How did the mega blocks move from this site intact over to the Sun Temple? A, without breaking, and how were they shaped and put into place? That's the evidence we have that a high technology civilization once existed in Cusco and the sacred area of Peru thousands of years prior to the Inca, and so far back in time that there's no oral tradition whatsoever about them, except possibly that they were giants. Not necessarily giants physically, but giants of mind. And that's the lost history that we're trying to, re to retrieve again. And on our way down the mountain, we came a different route. We've been through several uh, Inca ruins, small, probably those of uh, farmers, but then this, which is an Inca tomb, and it seems to be still intact. Well, so much for being intact, but you see the entranceway of the window faces east. And as we go around here and into the sacred valley, you see it's pointing to Oyente Tambo. So you can see from the walls we're going past that Inca people or Inca period people lived here. They were most likely relatively poor farmers living up in the highlands above the uh, sacred valley. Certainly not the royal Inca family who lived in places such as the center of Cusco and Oyente Tambo. So clearly, the Inca were using that quarry, but from what I saw, the scale of the work that they were engaged in was in maybe the size of two to three tons. I did actually see one that was much larger that had been shaped, almost as though it was a, a chunk of butter that had been troweled. That one, I would guess, would have been between 20 and 30 tons. But I don't think the Inca did that. I think that was an earlier culture. However, what it will take is simply more explorations of the area, more time, more contributions from uh, our different guests, and you can be one of them at www.hiddenincatours.com.